Greetings. NFL football is among the world's most lucrative sports. With high salaried players and very rich owners, and a fan base that includes multiple generations embracing team spirit. Spirit generated significantly by the cheerleader squads. They not only bring spirit, they are ambassadors for the team. Yet the cheerleaders face unfair and in many cases unlawful labor conditions, including self sex discrimination and sexual harassment and wage theft to mention a few. Behind the glamor and glitz, these are low wage workers fighting for fairness. I am Mark Gaston Pierce, visiting professor and executive director of the Workers' Rights Institute here at Georgetown Law. Co-moderating with me is Jamila Bowman Williams. Dr. Williams is an associate professor of law and faculty director at the Workers' Rights Institute. She received her JD from Stanford Law School and her PhD in sociology, also from Stanford. Dr. Williams uses quantitative and qualitative methods to investigate the nature of contemporary bias and the capacity of law to reduce inequality and promote social change. Her research has been published in a range of academic journals featured by numerous media outlets, and she frequently consults leaders in business, government, and higher education regarding their workplace practices. Before joining Georgetown faculty, Dr. Williams worked as an associate in the employment law practice of Paul Hastings LLP in Chicago, where she specialized in ad advising employers on internal audits of employment processes and diversity and inclusion programs. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Professor Pierce, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm now going to introduce the rest of our panelists. So I'm gonna start with my co-moderator and colleague, Mark Gaston Pierce who is the Executive Director of the Workers' Rights Institute and the uh, Visiting Professor at Georgetown Law Center. By appointment of President Obama, Professor Pierce served two terms as board member and chairman of the National, Rela National Labor Relations Board. Prior to assuming his position at Georgetown, Professor Pierce taught at Cornell University School of Industrial Labor Relations. He was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York and received his BA from Cornell University and his JD from the State University of New York at Buffalo Law School. His illustrious 40-year career includes District Trial Specialist Region 3 of the National Labor Relations Board, co-founder of the Buffalo New York Labor and Employment Law Firm, Creighton Pierce Johnson and Guru, and he was also a governor appointed member of the New York State Industrial Board of Appeals. He's currently an arbitrator and fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. Next, we have Amanda Ross, who is a school counselor and the founder and executive director of Dream Big Inc., where she empowers youth to be the best version of themselves through cheerleading, leadership, interpersonal skill development, and self-love. Amanda and her dream team host Big, Big Dream Cheerleading Camps, clinics and workshops that focus on impacting underserved city communities with an emphasis on supporting minority children. She founded Dream Big in 2018 when she completed her fifth season as an NFL cheerleader for the Baltimore Ravens and finished her master's degree in education and school counseling. Amanda represented the Baltimore Ravens at the 2018 Pro Bowl in Orlando, Florida, as well as traveled to Afghanistan, Africa, and London to represent the team and to support our United States military troops. Welcome, Amanda Ross. Next, we have Makiba Pate. Makiba Pate is founder and host of the Pro Cheerleading podcast, The Truth Behind the Palms which reveals the untold truths of professional cheerleading and supports the community of aspiring alumni and current pro cheerleaders from various sports teams. 
Makiba is a former NFL cheerleader for the Seattle Seahawks, including two Super Bowl appearances. And she's also performed at over 50 home games and various community events throughout the Pacific Northwest. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in marketing from Georgetown University and a JD and MBA from Temple University. She practiced law for over eight years, specializing in commercial transactions, intellectual property, privacy, consumer protection, advertising, and marketing law. Welcome, Makiba Pate. Next, we have Wegu. Wegu is a filmmaker and visual artist born in Ch Chongqing, China, and raised in Vancouver, Canada. She received her MFA in film production at the University of Southern California. She explores themes of identity, migration, and artistic freedom with a lyrical and visceral approach. Wee's hybrid documentary, A Moth in Spring, which follows her family's fight for freedom and expression in China, premiered at Hot Docs International Film Festival and was broadcast on HBO. She co-directed the feature documentary, Who is Author Chu? Chronicling, chronicling the redemption of an Asian American Jeopardy champion turned internet iconoclast. Her second feature film continues to explore the intimate journeys of people rising from the margins to transform the mainstream. A Woman's Work, a woman's work world premiered at the 2019 Tribeca Film Festival and won Best Emerging Filmmaker Award at the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. That is the film that's the topic of our conversation this afternoon, so welcome, we. And then last but not least, we have Sean Cooney, who is a partner at the Dochi firm in Buffalo, New York, with a practice based on representing construction workers and holding insurance companies accountable in civil litigation. Since 2014, Sean has represented the former Buffalo Jill plaintiffs in misclassification cases, and he's proud to have achieved on summary judgment the important determination that these cheerleaders were, in fact, employees as a matter of law. Sean is a graduate of St. Louis University and SUNY at Buffalo Law School. He's a proud member of the American Association of Justice and the New York State Trial Lawyers Association. Outside of the law, he is an active member of the community, having served as member and board member of Buffalo-based environmental justice and worker safety organizations, among others. He resides in Buffalo with his wife and two daughters. So welcome to all of the panelists. Thank you all for being here. We're definitely looking forward to this discussion. So I'm gonna start out with questions for Amanda Ross and Makiba Pates. Okay, all right. Well, thank you again for being here. So let's just start out. Some of us in the audience have watched the film, some haven't. So um, let's just start out with some of the background about why you personally um, were inspired to become cheerleaders and where did you um, think cheerleading would lead you? Sure, I can start. Um, I hear an echo, I'm so sorry, but I, I cheered at Georgetown University for my time while I was in school, and um, I actually have a different story of starting in professional cheerleading a little late. Um, I had been practicing for five years, had two kids that were one and three when I first auditioned, but it was a way for me to return back to something that I enjoy doing, a passion of mine. And when you've cheered in college, the next level for you really is uh, at the pro level, whether it's the NFL or NBA. And I was just inspired to just see if I had what it takes to make it at that elite level of, of within my profession. And that's when I started auditioning for the Seattle Seahawks. Great. How about you, Amanda? Yeah, so for me, I started out as a competitive gymnast. Um, and I was a competitive gymnast for about 10 or 11 years. And I was on the, um, the playground in middle school and I saw these girls that were tumbling and I was like, oh, they're doing exactly what I'm doing, but they're not gymnasts, what are they doing? And so then we ended up connecting. They told me about the sport of cheerleading. I instantly fell in love with it um, and continued throughout all-star, high school, college, and then went to the pro level. And I think um, it was the relationship and community building piece that I loved so much about it. And then I ended up having coaches along the way that were former NFL cheerleaders that I aspired to be that one day. 
Okay, great. That's great for background. Um, okay, so that's sort of what brought you to the sport and professional cheering. Now tell us a little bit of the background about some of the employment challenges, because that's kind of what brought us here and that's what's highlighted in the film as well. What are the some of the um, challenges that you personally faced or that you have observed cheerleaders facing in the NFL? I can start with this one. So it's interesting because all of the NFL teams are different, and I'm not sure if everyone realizes that, but there really are no consistent um, rules and guidelines in place for all the teams. So for me, one of the biggest um, challenges wasn't necessarily around pay, although I do feel like that can definitely be improved. It was more so around parking, being able to you know, have a spot at the stadium where I'm not lugging my luggage um, down Baltimore City in my cheerleading uniform and going to the stadium. Um, things like benefits are things that I definitely think that, you know, women in the sport of cheerleading and men could really benefit from. And across the board, it seems like wages are something that people um, don't have consistently. They're not getting paid for everything and also safety and protection um, against sexual harassment. Now let me keep add to that. Yeah, with the Seattle Seahawks, they actually, I think, treated us pretty well. Um, we didn't have issues in terms of pay, paid hourly for every appearance, practice, game. Um, it wasn't a lot, but it was definitely accounted for um, the time that we spent um, on behalf of the organization. In terms of like benefits, we had sponsorships uh, with gyms and tanning salons and hair salons. You know, in my experience, I wasn't really able to use some of those benefits because being a black woman, um, I paid out of pocket for a lot of the uh, beauty upkeep, I guess you would say, for being uh, a professional cheerleader. And so that was not necessarily fair. And I think just because of my background, um, what I noticed, especially when signing the contract when you make the team is just that there really wasn't a sense of uh, safety in asking questions. I mean, I definitely, my rookie year, asked plenty of them. and. Uh, I didn't make it back after my rookie year. I mean, <laughs> I had to come back and make it four years in a row after that, but maybe it was because I asked too many questions, but I think there was just a sense of you just accept what you're told and um, you just don't really have the the flexibility or freedom or safety to, to raise questions about fairness. But overall, I think the Seahawks were complying with the law and, and making an effort to provide for their cheerleaders and which is very different from what a lot of the women in the NFL have experienced, so. Okay, so maybe your teams, there could be some things that were better than other teams, but it isn't consistent across is what it sounds like. Um, okay, so can you tell me a little bit more, Makiba, about these sort of the cost to keep up what you need to do to be a cheerleader um, or these requirements of the team? And it sounds like some of the grooming, or I don't know what you call the requirements that they were paid for for some, but not others? Is that how it worked or? Yeah, I mean, with the, the salon services, there weren't um, stylists that specialize in our hair. So I think for me, um, especially living in Seattle, Washington with, we're out there dancing in the rain for three, four hours and, you know, you're trying to look glamorous and make it all seem flawless and, and easy. And so for myself personally, I had to pay for extensions or just things that would protect my hair with all of the practicing and and like I said cheering in the elements and so that was an out-of-pocket expense I think in terms of traveling throughout Washington State for appearances um, it was almost just kind of like you we were supposed to get mileage but again we didn't do our own timesheets and requesting things made you feel like you were asking for too much if you will and I never looked at doing uh, this for, for money, I called it gas money. And so I didn't really pay too much attention to that, but it is a job and you should be compensated for certain things that I think it was just a known thing not to trouble the director with too many, too many asks. Mm -hmm. And the requirements, the hair and makeup, those things were re rules that you had to do and comply with. Yeah. Okay. Down to the, down to the lipstick shade for us at least. Okay. <laughs> but we were given, again, we were given some, you know, discounts towards makeup, but you're still paying for it. Um, and we had services for hair and makeup at the games, but for every appearance that you're doing and paying for the makeup and, and everything that you're required to keep that look up, uh, it was out of pocket. Okay, thank you. And then Amanda, let me follow up and just ask you a little bit more about the safety issues. You both mentioned that. 
what types of things did you experience from a safety standpoint or things that you felt like you were in jeopardy or harassment or any of those types of things, if you can give us a little more on that. Sure. Yeah, so um, the team that I cheered for, the biggest safety concern was parking for me. Um, I felt like after the game and even before the game, you know, we'd get there really early in the morning before games. You had to be there at least seven hours um, before the game started. Um, and then we would be there after the game finished because we'd have to, you know, get ourselves back together, pack up our uniforms, pack up the locker room. And we would have to carry our suitcases in our uniform, in our practice uniform that says cheerleaders. You know, they just saw us out there dancing in crop tops and we're having to carry our luggage down the street through Baltimore City. And there have been people um, who have gotten their uniform stolen before or, you know, have had other instances. And thankfully, I have never personally had that where someone has stolen my uniform or attacked me. But we've had fans like yell things at us before when we're walking or want to take pictures with us. And it's never really like we're off. So when we get off the field, we're never really off the field because we still have that you know, 10, 15 minute walk where we have to go get to our cars and still pass fans along the way. And that can be a huge safety concern, especially when alcohol is involved and, and fans are drinking the entire time. Okay. So that sounds like something as simple as just getting you a parking spot closer if that's, yeah, if, if, okay, to the job. All right. So I guess I want to know a, a bit more as well about some of, I know you said, you both said you didn't have the pay concerns as much, but other people do, we know, and say we know that there is a variation across the team. Some are bad, some are worse than others. Why generally have you seen people take this for so long if you think that it's problematic? I, it sounds like you started this a little bit, Makiba, about just being kind of scared to speak up to the establishment, um, even when you feel like you're being harmed or that it isn't fair. Can you each speak a little bit on that? Sure. I mean, I think, like I said, I I didn't really hesitate to speak up. I, I did a lot. I asked questions a lot, always respectfully, but I definitely felt like I was kind of the black sheep my rookie year because of that. And again, not making it back, maybe that was why. But I think in terms of like, a, if you look at the broader picture of why we all cheer in, in light of all the issues, it's really because it's a passion that you're pursuing. You don't even necessarily know how, what the conditions are like until you're in the situation. And again, you're not really presented with an opportunity to you know, to take a step back and say, well, I really want this, but I'm looking at the contract here and I don't really think it's fair that we can't compete or, or mention that we're a cheerleader or, you know, there's no room for negotiation and you've worked so hard to get to that point and it really is the height of your profession to dance at this level. So you're really making a choice between pursuing your passion and just kind of shutting up and dancing and just dealing with it or putting a mark on yourself or you may not make it back through auditions or getting blacklisted, it's happened. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the tension there of why people are still pursuing it and hoping to hopefully make a difference, but why you're more or less going along with the program. Mm -hmm. So you feel though that you are retaliated against? A little bit. I mean, I made it back, uh, like I said, after one year off the team, it was pretty controversial. It wasn't a very diverse team at the time. And, um, but yeah, I, I do feel like I made a mark on my back a little bit, um, just because there's a, the way that the direct, some of the directors lead the teams, it's just don't question my authority. They kind of try to insulate the program and maybe they're protecting us from things that are going on in the front office, I don't know, but the way that they, their leadership, it's just, you don't ask questions and, and challenge the way that they run the program essentially. And that's kind of what you're up against. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Amanda? So just back to the question about sort of why people take this. Yeah, I, I think that we are just ingrained with this, um, this attitude of gratitude, like being grateful that you're there. Like, okay, well, there are hundreds and thousands of girls that, you know, want your spot and you were selected to, to have this spot. And so um, it is almost ingrained in us in every 
every second that, you know, your spot can be given away. It can be um, taken. You should be grateful to be here. You should be grateful that you get to wear this uniform and be out there on the field in front of 70,000 people. And we are very grateful for that, but it doesn't mean that we should settle for not having what we should. Right. Or that you should have to compromise your safety to do that when you're showing up for the team and things. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So Makiba, it sounded like from the beginning, you sort of stood up and spoke up and um, how about you, Amanda? What sort of made you decide to stand up and fight for change and, and say that things aren't fair? Was it because of your own personal situation or trying to advocate for others? It was more so advocating for others. Um, my cheerleading experience, my NFL cheerleading experience was very great. Um, I did not have a lot of challenges. Like I mentioned earlier, my biggest thing was really parking and, you know, that a pay increase would be nice, but I did feel like the Ravens organization um, respected us. My director respected us and listened to us. Um, but when I retired, I actually had time to look into the lawsuits that were happening because I was cheering during a lot of the lawsuits and I saw the changes happen while I was on the team, but I never really put two and two together. I, I almost turned a blind eye because it's like, well, those lawsuits are going on, but they don't have anything to do with me. So I'm not really gonna worry about that. And when I retired, it was like the blinders were off. I realized like, oh my goodness, these you know, women aren't getting the same thing that other women aren't getting. And it did make me want to advocate and stand up for other women so that everyone could have an amazing experience. So were there anything or any particular things that really like just really burned you up that you saw like, okay, this is enough is enough. That really isn't right. Like generally maybe some things are okay, but those were just so bad that you had to stand up. Yeah, the, the pay was, very, I mean, to not get paid for practices, appearances, game days, some people were not getting that. And that's just a basic thing that you're getting paid for your time. Um, you know, again, like being able to speak up for yourself, some of the, of the um, contracts and rules didn't really allow people to be able to have a voice and to speak up. And that's something that um, is silencing women and men in sports if you're not going to give them an opportunity to really um, participate fully and engage in the sport. Mm -hmm. Sounds like some of the issues with the football players too, um, even though they're getting paid well. Um, okay, well, let's see. We have another... I think we'll, we're we gonna come back to you with a few more questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mark now to go to WeGoo to talk some about the film and capturing what it was like to capture some of this. Thank you. WeGoo. Hello. Hi. I watched the film twice. I, I watched the uh, PBS airing and then, then, then I watched the uh, film that you were gracious enough to provide for us. Um, and the, that one was a little bit longer and a little bit more in depth with respect to certain things like, like player organizing and, and so forth. But let me, let me give you, ask you a, uh, a question about, um, what, what inspired you to make this film? Yeah, so um, I was born in China and raised in Canada, and I didn't know anything about football or cheerleading. I didn't grow up with that at all. The only imagery or knowledge I had was from movies, you know, like Friday Night Lights or, you know, any given Sunday, um, Bring It On, like those classic Hollywood films. And to me, they just seemed like, you know, all of those people seemed larger than life. And in some ways, they were these huge sort of icons, but also stereotypes, you know, of themselves. And so when I came to Los Angeles to go to USC, um, you know, the, the Trojans at the time were coached by Pete Carroll. They were like doing so well. Everyone in the community loved them. I was just shocked to see how they brought together so many different people across class, race, et cetera, um, who loved the game and loved watching these games and actually tutored football players. Um, in English literature and essay writing. And I got to see, you know, the dynamics of the teams. I mean, most of them were African American. They're recruited from the you know neighborhoods around in terms of South Central, South LA, um, and they had, they had these huge dreams to go to the NFL. But the reality was that most of them would not 
make it. And so when I when I heard about you know Lacey's lawsuit that she brought up in 2014 for wage theft, that she as an NFL cheerleader was getting paid less than five dollars an hour to be part of this huge multi billion dollar in industry that is America's favorite pastime. It made me, as someone who is an outsider, as someone who is an immigrant, and maybe really curious to examine American culture, American mythology through this story, through getting to know her, you know, where and she that came was, from. That, that was the Oakland Raider lawsuit. That was the Oakland right? Raiders. Yeah, she, she sued the Oakland Raiders. Um, and that's really where it started for me. Mm. Okay. Well, um, is it, did it cause you to engage in uh, a lot more research in order to put this this film together? You said you were you were not uh, familiar with with football until you came to the, the United States. Did you become a football fan at all? <laughs> uh, yes, I did actually. So when I was at USC, I never went to any games. I was like, I don't understand what this is at all. Um, but when I, you know, afterwards, um, I started main thing is I started watching movies and TV shows about football because the main thing I was interested in were the narratives that was inherent in the sport and what made it popular you know in terms of like the under underdog narrative or when you're coming from a poor family and most of the players you know African-American communities and then they're launched into this fame and this huge broad appeal um you know stories like you know players like oj simpson for example those things were really fascinating to me and you know after meeting lacy and having her be on the team i also we also did a lot more research in terms of looking at the institution and the systems at play of the nfl like how for, for example profit sharing worked um how the you know teams the pay structure of the teams worked and from you know the concession uh, Stan Person to Roger Goodell, who is the commissioner. So a lot of research. Mm, yeah, I, I did a little research myself and I saw that that three of the top five richest sp sports team owners are NFL owners and all white men, of course. Um, so so uh, was it was it pretty shocking when you saw the disparity in pay that 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 the these women cheerleaders were subjected to yeah it definitely was shocking and i think for me as someone who grew up you know as an immigrant my my parents always taught me you know about the value of hard work and in in that sense they taught me about you know meritocracy like if you work hard you can succeed and you can be recognized for it but you know in in the reality especially in working on this film i realized that is not the case because of certain things like misogyny you know um sexism the patriarchy and also racism as you mentioned because of all these problems of inequality within our society that is not going to be the case mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, talking about racism, uh, the film focus appears to be mainly on the white cheerleaders uh, with one scene where there was one Asian cheerleader. I think she, in the scene, she had a few words and she was crying of, of, about some, some experience she was having. And, and then uh, there may have been uh, some cheerleaders of color way in the, the background. Um, uh, what was your view on that and what was what were you trying to convey if anything mm -hmm. well for me i think the film um i wanted to follow lacy's story because she was the first woman to speak out against this and and file the wage theft lawsuit so she was definitely a character and we actually followed two other women um one from the new york jets crystal cruz um who is latinx and then we had another woman manushkar actually from uh, Buccaneers, who is um, Black. But unfortunately for the film, um, in terms of the timeline of the film and the timeline of their lawsuits, really the two women, um, Lacey and Maria, were the two that we wanted to focus on. And it was also a matter of, of um, you know, access because for, it's not just about me wanting to, you know, casting these people. It's also, they have to cast, they have to choose me. They mm -hmm. have to, we have to build a, a relationship of trust. So, and sometimes that is just kind of left up to chance in some sense. But I do think that, you know, in terms of my uh, experience with the NFL cheerleaders, it actually 
is a, a lot of the teams, it varies across teams, but a lot of them, there are majority white women um, on those teams. And you don't actually, you actually, there is a, actually a lack of diversity. Um, for the Raider Rets, that was one exception actually, because um, one of the people who was in charge of their marketing, they realized their fan base is actually very diverse. So they wanted to actually have women from all different ethnic backgrounds to really appeal to all of those different fans because you're talking about Oakland, you're talking about Los Angeles. So they really kind of understood that. So you actually saw some more diversity in the Raiderettes team. Um, but I think Makiba, who actually did some research into diversity issues in the cheerleading team, she can also speak to that as well. But for me, I think it was interesting to see it from this perspective of looking at, you know, uh, white culture, in essence, and the dominance of that within the NFL and within, you know, these tropes and archetypes of women that they were using to market themselves. Um, and it was, it's intentional, you know, you have like the, you know, archetypal blonde woman, you have the, you know, brunette, and I think Lacey, because she was from the South, she kind of embodied that Southern woman you know, um, to that team. And they, they intentionally sort of cast her as that role. Mm. Well, how cooperative was the NFL in the making of this film? For me, um, I didn't, I wanted the film to really focus on the women and their journeys as they fought these legal battles, as their identities evolved through this process. So I, I, I didn't necessarily want to have you know an interview with Roger Goodell I think the the thing that we really did want to do is document some of the court hearings and in the Buffalo case we were able to um, film a hearing where the NFL lawyers were arguing their case um, and the Bills lawyers were there as well because I think that to me that speaks louder than any kind of like publicity interview that anyone from that organization could do because they're arguing their stance in this legal case like what is their argument against paying these women um you know a legal minimum wage so that was the most important thing and the other side of it is you know we knew that they weren't necessarily going to allow us to use you know a lot of the footage that they have generated like so much footage a huge media machine so we knew we wanted to pull these archival footage from NFL and sort of Re, I sort of transformed their meaning through integrating it within our film and using the characters, our characters as sort of a backbone and infusing this kind of new meaning to, to that footage. Well, thank you. This is, uh, um, this, this is pretty, pretty, pretty fascinating. Do you see yourself uh, doing a documentary on any other sports segments in your future? Um. I do have, especially through making this film, I do, I have developed an obsession with sports, I think. <laughs> I'm definitely interested in athlete stories and especially, um, you know, athletes that is not just focused on the sport that are interested in the world around them and understanding the world around them and changing the world around them and not, it's not so, you know, tunnel vision. And I think that's the most compelling because sports and athletes do have that impact on all of us on, on larger society. Right. Wonderful. Well, we'll be getting back to you with, with some more questions. I'd like to turn Thank it you. back over to Professor Williams, uh, and she's going to be talking with uh, Sean Cooney, the, uh, the representative, the legal representative of some of the plaintiffs. Thank you, Mark and we. That was fascinating. Okay, let's go on um, with you, Sean. So, Let's get into this legal, this legal stuff. So this is a law school program, of course. Um, so why don't you start by, just tell us a little bit about how you ended up taking on this case. Well, my clients are six women who serve as class representatives and individual plaintiffs. And then there's over um, just about 70 class members. But it all began when this first group of them heard about Lacey T in Oakland. And there was some, some news coverage that Lacey um, was participating in that sounded very familiar to what Amanda called the attitude of gratitude. Um, and basically this feeling that you know, they didn't have a say over some very fundamental things about their experience, like safety, like pay, uh, schedule, um, whether or not they would be participating in games. 
And when I, they first reached out to our firm and one of my partners, and when I first heard about it and they told me that they didn't receive any money. So it's not like Makiba's experience where they thought that it could be better if they had a bigger voice but they received compensation that was at least arguably within the bounds of the law. Here in Buffalo, they weren't paid any money for games, practices. Most of the appearances were, were wholly unpaid, zero money, as if they were donating their time at a food drive for the National Football League. So when I first heard that, I remember just not believing it. I just felt like there must be something I'm missing. How could they not pay them any money and then they brought in the contract and very similar to what I think we saw in Oakland. We didn't know that at the time, but those initial contracts we knew pretty quickly were unenforceable or illegal and that we could offer some help. What was really interesting for us is that the, Jill, the actual Jills aren't employed directly by the Buffalo Bills football team. It's part of a series of transactions. And so that was what really kind of made the legal fight for us uh, more interesting than, all right, we just have to get these employees paid. It was also about who's really responsible for making this unpaid activity happen in the first place. And then what was really early on, our individual Jills, they kept talking about how much they loved it. They loved cheerleading. They, it was their whole life. They were at this pinnacle. They loved the bill. Some of them are still, you know, right now thrilled they're wearing Josh Allen jerseys, even though they're plaintiffs in a lawsuit against the Buffalo Bills because they could separate very early on. I love this work, I love this team, I love this city, but we're not being paid and that's not right. And so when they were able to recognize that, it was very, very fitting for me and my firm to say, all right, well, we gotta try to help them. Okay, great. So, um... So you heard, so when you heard about Oakland, then you started looking into the Buffalo situation. Is that how it happened? Yeah. So my clients knew about Lacey. So very much so Lacey's uh, willingness to come forward first in Oakland inspired the individuals who came forward in Buffalo. Very, okay. Got it. Firm. And they knew you as a local firm and came and said, can you look at this for us? And exactly. then you started taking a look and said, oh, wow, there's something here. And they had their, their contract, they had their rules and we were able to look at it and say, something's not right. Okay. And, and what was not right was that it was illegal. They were misclassified, mm -hmm. and unpaid. Mm -hmm. And so we, we brought claims to have them established as employees, which you mentioned in the introduction is one of the real key aspects of all of the cheerleader misclassification cases, which hopefully uh, what I mean by that is that the amount of control that all of these cheerleaders were under through their football employers makes them Mm -hmm. under the law employees and employees are entitled to minimum wages under statutes that have been around for hundreds of, for a hundred years and so yep. we knew that we could prove that control and we could make that claim happen in addition those all the things that a amanda was talking about safety the things that mckee was talking about about expenses that very much existed in buffalo too but in order to have a voice in that at its core, we had to find out to make sure they actually are employees that have the rights to, to stand together to make those suggestions and that are actually in the form of demand. So what were the, so I saw that the employee and we know there's the, the classification, are they employees or are they independent contractors or are they just simply volunteers? But I noticed in the film that you said, whoa, it says here that explicitly that they're employees. Was this more of a joint employer question? Like who are the employers? I know you also saw that, whoa, and if, um, Roger Goodell signed this. So the yeah, NFL yeah. knew about this. Tell us a little bit more about that and how you sorted out both that they were classified as employees or should have been, and then also who the real employer was in this case. Yeah, that's the, that who the employer is, is the biggest issue in our case. And a lot of the other cheerleaders around the country, if not all of them, they had agreements with the actual team alone. In Buffalo, we first sued the, the Buffalo Bills because they controlled everything. And they had partners with a radio station and they had partners with a local production company. But when we first sued it, we didn't sue the NFL. We just sued those teams. And in response, the Bills made a motion to dismiss and said, we're not the employer. It's really this radio station. And they attached a contract to that motion. That contract 
actually had the illegal misclassification agreement as part of it, and it was stamped approved by Roger Goodell. So when it was when we saw that that we realized not only did the bills make this happen locally to these the radio station, the production company as the joint employer, but the NFL actually approved it the whole way. And so a big part of our case is whether or not the bill status is a joint employer because they provide all of the, um, they provide much of the equipment, they approve what happens, they transfer the relationship from one contractor to the next without changing anything. They own the, the Jill's trademark, and then the NFL's approval of the process and knowledge that it was illegal is what, what makes us think the NFL had the power to stop it. They mm -hmm. didn't do it. And they benefited a lot from the work that a lot of these cheerleaders is, have done, including like Amanda mentioned, uh, or I think you mentioned in her introduction, Amanda traveled overseas as part of a program that the NFL participates in with the Department of Defense. And that same thing has happened here. It happened where the NFL had cheerleaders from around the league go to Mexico as part of an international publicity. A lot of that's captured in the film, but the NFL was clearly benefiting from the work of all these women and just not being willing to actually make sure they're paid a lawful or decent wage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So really the underlying real foundational question is about the employees in the joint employer status. And then that opens up the possibility for all of these other claims. So the compensation you have at least the minimum, you know, they need to be paid a basic minimum wage for the work. Um, you also have the harassment issues that come up. So whether it's protection from fan harassment, maybe there was, you know, on some teams, maybe there's something within the organization. Um, there were other things as well. Um, we talked about all of those rules. So how are, are all of those rules, I guess, go to the control that they were having over the employees, but also are there privacy issues with all of that? Because I know there's a lot of um, control as well of what they do off of the job when they're in their own personal lives. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the grooming requirements. There's the, you talked about the mandatory arbitration agreement in there. Tell us about any of those other claims that you were, you think were core after you get through that foundational kind of status question. So for, in our initial case, it's really about the economics. So those other issues, safety, privacy, those were real aspects of the experience that Jill's had but we made a strategy to focus on their status as employees and the economic reality that the legally misclassified and cost. So what does it mean? It means that they should be paid for the almost 400 hours a year that they work and practice and in game days and travel. But it also means when they have an, a uniform that costs $650, they shouldn't have to pay for it. When they have um, calendars that they sell to make revenue, they shouldn't have to pay the organization the price of the calendars and then go sell them like they're raising money for a little league. Uh, that's not how an employment situation would work. And we thought that, that those claims were so obviously not fair and causing real economic loss to the Jills that they were really the best way to focus initially. And then in the rules, there were lots of other things that, you know, how to eat soup, uh, hygiene requirements, grooming requirements, right down to the shade of the lipstick. Everything was in those same rules. And so proving that control was so obvious, but it also really highlighted who was not addressing the safety and privacy and other concerns that, that I think they, they wanted to be addressed. Okay, okay. So... It sounds like most of this was just the minimum wage, like at least pay them the minimum wage for those hours. Did the did a pay equity analysis ever come up where you had to actually look at what their worth should be and like how they were paid as women compared to other people who, you know, other jobs that may have been held by more men or was there any of that type of, of analysis in there? Yeah, so what we, one of the types of claims that we brought in our case was they decided that Jill's management decided that cheerleaders weren't worth the minimum wage. They wouldn't even pay them. So once now that they're employees, they want the benefit of minimum wage. And our argument is that you don't get the benefit of minimum wage when you refuse to acknowledge it in the first place. So we argue that the Jills are actually owed $35 an hour because on, a, on very rare circumstances, some of the appearances 
would be made to like a private venture. So if they went to like a car dealership and they would charge money for that appearance, they would get paid $35 an hour. So our argument is that's their regular rate of pay, $35 an hour. And every other second that they weren't paid, the employers don't get to now say, oh, you only get minimum wage. I think they should have to pay the $35 an hour. And there's some proof in our uh, case that that is in fact what the directors would charge other companies book, you know, to actually have a Jill appear or a number of Jills appear to help that company publicize an event or something like that. So I think that is a, it may not be equal to your question with what the mascot or what an NFL mm -hmm. player or what a man might get paid if, if they were in a similar position, but it is much more than minimum wage. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so hopefully it sort of invites, in addition to our case, it invites that question of equity as a And how to, much, yes. Exactly, how, how much. How much, and not just saying, oh, just pay them at least minimum wage, the bare minimum, and right. then say, you know, everyone gets paid for showing up. So in the, in the film, they said, you know, the person selling the beers and the person cleaning the, stadium like everyone gets paid right. something so just in terms of how to calculate that but I get your angle on saying well they charge for their appearance for them to show up and based on how much they're profiting off of sending them out there is how you can kind of think of about calculating what their worth should be at least for those private appearances in okay addition, in the NFL's media by the, you know their media revenue is so great and cheerleaders show up in all the broadcasts so that's one of the other things we like to think about is what's the media what's the advertising revenue that a cheerleaders work is helping the nfl sell mm -hmm. okay let's see what else should we talk about for a couple of minutes left um you want to talk about any of the frustrations or challenges that you faced i know there were probably many but yeah. So my case is still going on and there's two really, really interesting things I think. Number one is about 60 of our class members opted out of the lawsuit. In other words, they chose not to participate. And one of the really hard things is why, is how somebody who loves being a cheerleader could also reconcile that we should, we should sue this case. So kind of navigating some, each member's love for the team and their right to get paid is something that we're still figuring out. And then also, the companies went, two of the companies went bankrupt. So we've had a multi-year stay of our case because of bankruptcy, which is very frustrating because they didn't want to pay them the right wage to begin with. And now that they're responsible to pay at the radio company, they can just file bankruptcy and sort of wash their hands. So it's just another um, hurdle to overcome, but a very big challenge for us in our case. Mm -hmm. And that's just good for the attorneys or future attorneys in the audience just to think about some of the roadblocks but then how you still have to persist through those and um, adjust your strategy and just kind of stay resilient through that that's right okay right. sounds good well thanks sean i appreciate that let's turn it um oh you're on this next part too so let's have you and then amanda and makiba talk with mark about some of the organizing hi everybody that was fascinating, Sean. Now, Sean, um, our relationship comes from me being in Buffalo and me meeting you there when you're just starting your career. And it was just fascinating when I watched the, uh, the, uh, the, the documentary and saw you there. And I said, hey, I know this guy. And, uh, and, it, and it seems like you were doing some pretty courageous stuff. Um, Amanda and, and, and Makiba, um, it, it was exciting to hear that you all were doing things uh, relating to organizing and, and, and having programs and, and initiatives in, in that regard. Uh, the one thing that I, I saw, uh, Sean, that, that uh, was fascinating about my second viewing of the, of the documentary is that they did a little segment talking uh, with... Uh, an attorney that I know pretty well, Jim Schwan, about uh, the organizing efforts of the Buffalo Jills way back in the 90s. Uh, could you fill us in on some of that organizing background? Yeah, it's really um, interesting because after we sued our case, 
this lawyer that you know, Jim Schwan, called my office and said, did you know that in 1994, a group of cheerleaders formed a union and won a decision that their employee? Uh, we were floored. We couldn't believe it. How could it just go away? So he <laughs> filled us in and he, he had a, he had, he had one piece of paper left in his file. It was the decision from the, the board level decision determining that the Jills were employees and not independent contact trackers based on the almost verbatim rules and regulations that we saw in 2014. So we uh, wanted to figure out what happened. And what we learned was that a group of cheerleaders formed this union and they, you know what they were talking about in 1994 when they wanted a union? Safety, equal pay, cost for uniform, cost for the beauty routine that they had to go through. When I was listening to this panel today, as I have many times during the case thought about this, it's the same actual problem over and over again. Well, they were successful. They formed a union. They actually worked as union employees. They were originally affiliated with the IBW, the uh, Electrical Workers Union. Then they formed their own union. They split off. And eventually, the employer that they had was a subcontractor. The bills decided that they didn't want to have to pay the wages. And it looked like uh, they were going to fall apart. A travel agency picked them up. They ran as union employees for a while. And then somehow in 1996, a new uh, employer, a restaurant, a local restaurant picked them up and the group of workers there, some of them left that were in the union, most of them. And the rest of them were sort of given this false choice of like, you either have the gratitude to be a Jill or you have to uh, stand up for your rights. And when people, workers are forced to make that decision, they chose doing their dream of being NFL cheerleaders rather than keeping the, the union going because they were given that false choice. And then that was 1996. Nothing changed until 24 hours after we filed our lawsuit. And they immediately, just like after the union vote in 1994, they immediately suspended them. Um, even though other teams like Seattle, like Baltimore, a lot of teams around the league are start operating like it's, you know, the modern times and paying people at least a minimum wage. So hopefully that happens again in Buffalo. But that's the background with the, uh, the first National Football League union here in Buffalo. Are you aware of whether or not any unfair labor practice charges were filed? Yes. So I don't have a lot of information because the records are not accessible locally from the NLRB, but there was a lot of news coverage. And so in the Buffalo News, before the union was disbanded, the last article we found was that the, the union filed, uh, filed charges with the NLRB because they were basically locking them out and terminating them by refusing to renew the season. And then the union is over. And I think the reason is that the individuals that made up that union, they went on to other parts of their life because it was a temporary, a lot of the tenure for the Jills was only a few years. So, and then it's a new employer, a new entity, and all the bills, uh, management, the NFL, everyone else just basically pretended it never happened. Wow. Yeah. So, so it, it, to uh, close up shop and, and reemerge as a, a, another entity generally is an unfair labor practice, but those things would have to be pursued. And in my experience, um, if you have an independent union that is not affiliated with, with a union that will continue to pursue those kind of issues and those core members of that independent union drift away or decide to move on, that's this kind of scenario happens. Pretty, but it's a pretty amazing history. And it's my understanding uh, uh, that, that this was the first uh, NFL chilling squad to be unionized in the country. Is that correct? It's the only one I know, maybe McKeever or Amanda are no more, but it's the only one I'm aware of. Okay. Well, well, Amanda and McKeever, um, let me turn to you a little bit about that. Um, you both describe situations that did not sound, I mean, they, they sounded unfair, but they didn't sound horrible, horrible, you know, some, some people are, are working in conditions that, that are not, not as, not comfortable, um, and, 
would say that they have they'd ha they'd have it worse than than how, how you made it out to be. It sounded sounded like the you all were not getting paid fairly, but you were at least getting paid. Um, did did you have to get paid? Wait until the end of the year to get paid, or or or, or you you got your regular um, compensation? But so uh, given all of all of that and and. Um, what was it that made you decide that unionization is the appropriate path to go for for the cheerleaders? Amanda? Yeah, so actually it's interesting because um, unionizing really came up, um, at least for me, in a conversation that I was having with Dee Smith from the NFLPA. Um, and I had met him at a different event and we were having a conversation about how the NFLPA um, really helps the players and, and what that looks like and, and what that means and really explaining unionizing to me. Um, and that was really what got my wheels turning and I'm like, okay, wait, so what is this? And, and so we can do this and why haven't we done that? And at that point I was retired. So I could look a little bit more into it and um, kind of lose that fear mentality that my spot would be at Jeopardy because I've already finished my years. Um, and it, it made me want to figure out how to pave the way for the women and men that are cheering right now so that they don't have to put themselves at jeopardy right now and figuring out exactly what is it that, that you know, they have to do. And then if the employer finds out about it, you know, potentially retaliating, although I think that's illegal, they could find other ways. Um, and so I think that it really just um, made me want to, to pave the way in trying to unionize um, and figuring out how that starts. What about you, Makiba? Well, I started the podcast um, a year after I had retired as well. And this was right around the time that the lawsuits were going on and a lot of press around it. And so for me, as part of the podcast and discussing the issues that we face as pro cheerleaders um, and realizing that there were similarities, even with how NBA dancers were treated, I started putting two and two together in terms of what really would make a difference in versus just us, you know, complaining to the media, you know, really an actual solution to the problem. And so as part of my podcast, I'd been voicing the need for a union probably since the very beginning of starting it. And so when Amanda and I were put in touch with each other through WE, um, I was ecstatic at the idea of helping out in any way I could because I knew that this was probably the only way to have a, a true seat at the table. Mm. Did, did either or both of you get reaction from other current and formal former cheer, cheerleaders about wanting to unionize? So we did an episode. It was something that Amanda and I had talked about just because a lot of, you mentioned the word union and I think a lot of people in our space freeze up. They don't necessarily understand it. And what they do understand is that it was tried and failed. And so um, I thought the best way to reach this community, especially in light of the fact that current cheerleaders would have to be the ones to take the steps, was really just to educate them about what it means. And so we put together an episode um, to discuss what a union, what the benefits are, what it, what it's all about, and really just to try to work through the fear that exists in our community and space about standing up for yourself. And so there's been a lot of curiosity about it, I would say. We've had some sessions, and Amanda can speak to that too, about just trying to help people ask the right questions and just become informed because I think that's the first hurdle that we truly have in, in unionizing. What, what is typically the age of uh, a cheerleader that is um, first starting out coming into the NFL? Most teams you can start at 18, 18 um, and up. So, so a lot of cheerleaders may not be sophisticated with regard to, to the labor laws or anything like that. Absolutely. And I think they're just, again, so afraid of losing the opportunity to dance or being found out that they're even pursuing it. I think it's just been a challenge for people to, to just wrap their minds around it. And it is pretty complicated. And because we have to audition every year to make our spot, it just further complicates the issue of, is it worth jeopardizing this short window that you have to actually dance in the NFL? Mm. Now, now during the during the documentary, uh, there was a little segment from Damaris Smith, the um, uh, where they interviewed him, and he was saying that it was pretty shameful the way um, 
uh, well, Damara Smith, of course, is the executive director of the NFL Players Association. And um, uh, how has, uh, how was the NFL Players Association support with regard to um, um, your efforts? So they, um, they, I'm very grateful for them because they have been supportive. Um, initially, like I said, the conversation with um, D. Smith really helped, uh, you know, move things forward. And they were able to put me in touch with the AFL-CIO where I was able to actually um, go to the AFL-CIO Organizing Institute and, and learn how to be an organizer. Um, so I, I am grateful for their support. Um, and, you know, I hope that their support continues um, moving forward um, in, in our endeavors. Well, that's great. Now, now, Sean, um, th they talked about the contracts that these um, uh, cheerleaders had to had to sign. Um, did you have the opportunity to take a look at those contracts before we sued the case? Or you mean yeah. back in '94? Well, no, I'm talking about uh, when you sued the case, the, con the, the individual contracts that the cheerleaders had to, had to sign. So after the cheerleaders made it through audition, they immediately were invited to a meeting. And the meeting is all about the attitude of gratitude is the thing I'm going to keep coming back to. It was about the bills could disband us at any time. You're in the NFL. You, we, there are lots of things expected from you. And by the way, sign this piece of paper. And so they, they all had their unsigned copy of the contract and in a binder that also had the rules and their schedule of appearances and some other things, depending on what they collected. So we saw the agreement and it had, uh, it said you will receive no money in the agreement. That's one of the terms. And so when you read that, you know, at that point, I was just shocked. But it also said a couple other things. They're, they're, they can be terminated at will. And they are subject to a strict schedule. And they must abide by these guidelines. So it clearly was inconsistent right on it, at its core. When you would look at it, you cannot have that kind of control and then not pay people money. It was very clear right from the beginning to us. Oh, I remember in the documentary, they talked about um, the arbitration agreement that the, they, they had there and that, that Roger Good, Goodell was the arbitrator? That was in Oakland. Yeah, in Oakland, that was, uh, I think they, uh, Lacey's lawyer, Sharon Vinick and others were able to um, prevent that from happening as, and, and they were successful at doing that. Um, but in ours, we didn't have that uh, arbitration issue. We were able to sue in New York State Supreme Court, which is part of the reason why I think we ultimately got the agreement that Roger Goodell had stamped his approval on uh, that actually attached this illegal agreement to it. I see. Uh, what about you, Makiba? Did you all have to sign a contract? Yes, we did. And very similar uh, to what Sean said, it's in a binder with all of the rules, regulations, how the calendar sales worked, like every expectation of us was part of our orientation. And uh, me with my prior legal background and working in contracts daily, it was really um, off-putting. And I'm like reading quickly, but you're you're signing that along with all of your paperwork for uh, your W, what, just all of the initial paperwork that you sign when you start a job. And so the contract being kind of stuck right in there and you're having to, you know, submit the the copy of the contract right then and there on the spot. It's not a time to, again, sit and ask questions and negotiate the terms of it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you, Amanda? Same thing? Yep, same thing. And again, I would even echo Makiba's last point, just especially about it not really being an environment where you are able to really take a step back and, and say, well, can I take this home? And if, if the director is okay with that, it's never really shared in the beginning. Like, oh, you, you can take this home. You can think about it. This isn't gonna jeopardize your spot. It's more so like, okay, if you wanna make the team, you're gonna sign this and we're gonna move forward. Okay. All right. Well, we're running out of time for this segment. So thank you. This was pretty fascinating. Uh, 
give it back to you, Dr. Williams. Okay, what a great discussion so far. So we have lots of questions already coming in for you all. So the audience is um, ready to engage with you further. If you all, if we all can have our cameras on during this, because these questions can come to um, any of you. Okay, so the first question says, I'm interested in the panelists' ideas regarding reforming the NFL cheerleading system. What would make it more fair and less less sexually exploited? Any, I can, yeah, anyone okay. can take it. I I would say that it um, if it's not the route of unionization, what would really be um, instrumental is just us having us being the NFL cheerleaders having a seat at the table to talk about what the best practices are across the various teams in the league. Um, as the host of the podcast and just a lot of the information we've gathered from trying to organize, we're learning that some teams do things very well and others not so much. And I think if there is any concerted effort by the NFL to actually establish a program or an office or a position whose responsibility it is to establish a baseline, a good one, of what the best practices should be across all of the 26 well, 24 if we count the Charger girls and the Washington football team, uh, first ladies of football, but something that would be consistent across the board and raising the bar as to how we're treated, um, that would really re start with the reform that's necessary and including us in that conversation is, is key. Okay, so having a stand, some standardized sort of rules or, or kind of guidance there on how to deal with this and, and voice from the cheerleaders. Okay, what about you, Amanda? What can make it um, more fair and less um, sexually exploitative? I think that having a voice is gonna be really, really important, having a seat at the table because right now, you know, cheerleaders don't have that voice. You, you have directors who were cheerleaders before. And so that fear mentality, that fear space is very much still there for people. And so even when you think about directors advocating for you, you have to also think about what's going on in their mind. Like, are they really going to be able to advocate fully for you when they also still have this fear mentality? So putting someone in the front office, not just at every, you know, um, uh, team, but really in the front office of the league that's in charge of the cheerleaders that can help make decisions alongside them and not make decisions for them. Okay, so just the structure of the leadership and who's responsible for this and ensuring fairness and having someone responsible for doing that. All right, anything to add, Sean? There's a great line in Wee's film where Sharon Vinick says, these billion dollar industries could throw a little, you know, a few hundred thousand here, a million there through all these lawsuits, but they're just too big and too immune to fix this problem with litigation piece by piece. So thank God we had Wee's great film to really like elevate this conversation because my lawsuit, you know, Lacey's lawsuit, they're never gonna solve the problem in the long run. The only real solution is a league wide union that can give all of the cheerleaders a voice together, not just one team as a union that might not survive, but a whole league wide voice to address the real substantive power imbalance that the NFL has just because it's so rich and so popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next question there. We have some, all right. So those are the ideas for a reform that we need. I know, of course, it sounds, there, there's so much work to be done behind that, but at least the organizing that Amanda and McKeever are doing, um, you know, those are definitely steps in the right direction, trying to get people organized around these things. All right, so the next question for we, there is footage highlighting the disproportionate parenting and housework done by one of the plaintiffs. Her husband complained about babysitting his own children. Was that just for background and color or an effort to highlight another form of uncompensated work done by women? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, oh, I hear a bit of an echo. I don't know if that other people hear it or... No, okay. You sound good. Uh, okay, great. Um, actually, it's kind of related to the previous question about, you know, how can 
how can change happen? And I think with the film, it's called, you know, the, the title is A Woman's Work. And I definitely from day one wanted to examine the relationship between sort of the unfair labor practices and work conditions of the, of the NFL cheerleaders and related to how women in general are treated across society, across different industries. And I think part of that is the, you know, invisible, um, uncompensated labor of housework, of childcare, of care work. And of course, through the pandemic, you know, that has been highlighted so much in terms of what does essential work actually mean? And um, I think, yeah, it's just the, the whole, I think part of the reason why, you know, this has part persisted for so long is also because of those social norms that have been established through time that women's work is not valued. You know, in, in the film, um, there's this vintage footage of, of a PSA saying, money is father's work, you know, mother's work is at home and she's, you know, obviously money is not related to that. So I think showing the private lives, showing the relationships of the women, their families and, and the way that they work in all aspects of their life was really essential to me because that is a true reflection of women and, and what our life is like. Yeah, and that's, that really shows the broader societal and structural issues that are there that are even, even go beyond these NFL kind of team by team issues. Right. Um, okay, let's, so that was specifically for you. Let's see. So the next question um, was for you, Sean, but you actually answered it with litigation on a team by team basis. Is this going to benefit the NFL and is unionization on the table? So here we know that unionization, you think that unionization is the right way to go. Where, so maybe this is for you, Sean and Makiba and Amanda, where do we think we're at in that process? And it does it seem possible? What would need to happen for that to get accomplished? That's me adding on to the question a little bit. <laughs> Amanda or Makiba, you wanna start? Yeah. I'll let you move. Did you wanna go, Makiba? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think that we have a long way to go um, in continuing to educate the cheerleaders on what unionizing is, that it's not a lawsuit, but it is giving yourself a seat at the table, um, and that it is going to take the league-wide approach. Like Sean said, you know, it it's more challenging to go team by team and just have one team do it or two teams do it when we could really all come together because we've already seen the changes that have been made from the lawsuits. We've seen the bravery and the courage that these women had trickle down to our benefit, whether that's from pay um, or other protections, like we have benefited from those lawsuits. And so I think continuing to educate the cheerleaders on um, what unionizing is and what that looks like. But we definitely have a long way to go. Um, and even thinking about what just happened with the Washington football team. And again, that fear that people have is, is really real. And the fear of losing NFL cheerleading as a whole is really scary for, for professional cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have a, I have a comment on, on that. In, in the film, they talked about, uh, they, they interviewed fans and some fans were saying, we, we don't care about the cheerleaders. Um, other, others, you know, they showed their, their little kids that all were running to get autographs from, for, from the cheerleaders. Uh, others were saying very derogatory things about, about, about the cheerleaders. Um, and, and then there were some women that actually were saying, Cheerleaders are demeaning to women, and it's uh, and my sense of fe feminism. Um, did you all experience those kind of dynamics, and it, did that play heavily into the ability of cheerleaders to un to uh, have solidarity for unionizing purposes? That's a loaded question, and yes, the answer is it absolutely plays a part. I think um, what we struggle with as uh, pro cheerleaders and one of the other reasons that inspired me to start the podcast was just that there's just such a misconception of what being a pro cheerleader is even about. Um, they don't realize that we're not just a pretty face and that we don't just dance in revealing uniforms. Like we have careers and backgrounds and we actually are the ones that are out in the community giving 
uh, the fans a chance to interact with their favorite franchise. And it's through us that you don't get to shake hands with, you know, the quarterback and take a picture with him. You're interacting with us. And I think there's just um, this overwhelming sense of just that's all we do is dance. Or when you're on, when you see us on TV and all you see is us shake our pom-poms, you're not even seeing the hard work in our routines that goes into our performances. You're not seeing um, footage of what we do out in the community. So there's just a very, the way that we're marketed um, definitely does not help the cause at all. Amanda? Yeah, I so I agree with what Minky was saying. The way that professional cheerleaders are marketed is definitely um, not very helpful always to us. But I will say that on the other end of your question, and you know, there is a community um, that is rallying around professional cheerleaders because you have so many cheerleaders. I mean, cheerleading in general is a huge sport, even if it's not professional cheerleading. You have all-star cheerleading, you have collegiate cheerleading competitive. I mean, people, you have young girls and boys all over that really admire and look up to cheerleading. And I think that because that the sport is growing and people are learning more about it, that we are gaining a lot of allies that are like, oh, well, my daughter wants to be this one day. My son wants to be this one day. And so um, in a way, on the other end, it, it is helpful to us. Hmm. Can I just add on real quick to that? Um, I think some of the <laughs> Some of the responses by certain teams, I think, including the Washington team and maybe New Orleans, was to say, okay, well, let's, you know, cover up the cheerleaders. Let's change their uniforms to be longer, less revealing. Let's bring men onto the teams. Um, some of these changes are just really sidestepping the issue. I don't think the answer to, uh, you know, get rid of misogyny or sexism or sexual harassment is to make women dress in, you know, non-revealing closure like nuns outfits i don't know you know what i'm saying i think i think beauty glamour athleticism you know sexiness all of that you know is a part of it and it's like like makiba and amanda is saying they the women need to have a seat at the table to to determine how their image you know is portrayed and to, how to influence the culture of cheerleading right now they don't have any say in that so i think people also like in talking to the fans there was like that they were showing so much of that ingrained misogyny and internalized misogyny that you know is just so rampant in society overall as well mm, very very interesting wow yeah. okay i'm gonna go to the next question that we have that's related to college cheerleaders. So we haven't talked about that quite yet, but um, I know, um, I think um, Amanda, maybe both of you know, Makiba, do you have college cheering? Both of you are college cheers. Okay, so, and for Sean. So recently college cheerleaders have brought Title IX cases against their universities for sexual harassment and gender discrimination. Given these are students and not employees or independent contractors, how do you think college cheerleaders can fight the discrimination they face in light of your work with NFL cheerleaders? Maybe let's start with Sean. So I think there's legal issues related to a classification of a college athlete that, are, that has had a lot of news coverage and whether they should form a union and, or whether they're eligible to, I should say. It, and that is a whole, we could have a whole other podcast and movie about that question. But to relate it back to the work that Makiba and Amanda are doing in the NFL, one of the things that keeps coming back is like this lack of uniformity in the voice that the cheerleader has over their own experience. And if NFL cheerleaders have a voice at the union table about what types of protections, uniforms, conditions they're going to do their work in, those standards can be applied, maybe modified in different ways, but can be applied to the NCAA in a way that still has a cheerleader voice. So the way that like football helmet protections in the NFL are, are, are moving their way down through other avenues of American football, cheerleader rights in the NFL will hopefully sort of push those standards down. In addition to the legal realities facing college athletes, which is not at all a small issue itself. Um, and I, I think it can work the other way as well. So you all have talked some about the educational campaign that's needed to just help 
um, the cheerleaders kind of know that they have rights and understand that and be willing to stand up for it and what unionization is and all of those things to get rid of some of the fear and the myths. So some of that can start at the college level or even before that, for those of you who work with youth cheerleading, you know, youth cheering and those things, um, just to start to instill those earlier on. So it's not like something that they, then they get there and think that they just have to tolerate and deal with it because that's what they've always wanted to do and always learn, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, was a statement in the, in the chat uh, also that uh, there's a bill in Congress right now, um, the PRO Act, that if passed will make organizing a lot easier and there would be a lot more protections for people who are engaged engaged in organizing. Right now around the country, uh, uh, while union density hasn't changed, there is a desire or a sentiment uh, that favors organizing amongst, amongst the American public. Uh, after the experiences with the, with the, with the women's rights march, the, the uh, uh, BLM, um, the Occupy, and and uh, various uh, uh, movements that that uh, were stimulated by groundswell of of people working in collaboration. Maybe that kind of mentality and understanding and orientation will be helpful in cheerleaders understanding that they're banding together is what is going to give them a little bit of strength. So we have another comment from um, another cheerleader who's in the audience that I'll go to. It says, I'm a former Washington cheerleader. My husband is a union organizer um, with the IAMAW and I cannot stress what the possibilities are with union representation. My husband has firsthand experience of my years on the team and one of my former teammates even now works for this union. The IAMAW would give all cheerleaders a voice at the table and the power to have the weight of a strong international union that has reference for its organizers having a personal connection to this effort. So that's a thought there from the audience. Um, let's see, ProAct, you already mentioned that, Mark. I'll do one more. So another um, person from the audience says, in the union world, we talk a lot about how it's difficult to lift up conditions at one employer when an entire industry is low road. I'm curious about how this is for cheerleaders and dancers. How does the NFL stack up to other parts of the dance industry? Other thoughts or ideas on how we can lift up the conditions across the industry for Amanda and Makiba. So we talked about how we want to lift it, uplift it across the NFL, but how about across the dance industry as a whole? That's definitely something that we're mindful of because um, generally speaking, NBA dancers and the benefits that they get, the pay that they get is a lot better than minimum wage. And so I think we definitely have to uh, think about uh, other leagues and those, uh, the example that's set or the standard that's set for the NFL and the NBA will hopefully trickle down to, you know, if you want to call it the semi-pro teams as well as hopefully, you know, extending ourselves to figuring out what best practices are even for college cheerleaders as well. Because again, there's such, such similar challenges that we should be collaborating as much as possible to set the right standard across not just our own particular league, but other sports and industries as well within this cheer and dance space. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would even say to the point of educating when Professor Williams, when you were mentioned earlier, um, just really educating people, but also, you know, when you are a director and a coach and you're running a program, you have a responsibility to your cheerleaders to not turn a blind eye. I mean, the amount of trust that cheerleaders put into their directors and their coaches, that's why we're signing the contract too. Like, yes, we're grateful to be there, but we also trust that you have our best interests at heart. And that if we don't have a seat at the table, that you will go to bat for us and that you could possibly have that seat at the table. And so when we talk about educating not only the cheerleaders, we also need to educate the directors. And, and I think they need to take um, a hard look at, at themselves and college coaches and say, okay, well, what can I personally do to move this forward? If a union is not necessarily happening right now, if this isn't trickling down to college right now, what can I do every day to make sure that I am setting a better standard 
for my cheerleaders and not setting them up for failure or to be silenced. So quick follow up on that, because we actually have one more. I was going to end on that. That's a great place to end. But there is one kind of thing in the chat that relates to that. It's in the Q&A. And it's about rebranding cheer, cheering and cheerleaders. So similar to what they did in the um, WWE. So where it's not just to be about D being divas and sexuality and all of those things, but also the professionalism and the hard work and like all of that go that goes into it. You think that can be part of this solution as well? I think Wee's point was just so spot on that we have to uh, really think about this notion of toning down our sexuality or you know what we wear and all of those things. I think we we're the ones that are out there. We're the ones that are wearing it, and so I think there might be a variety of of, um, of standpoints on that issue. But I just don't think it's something that we need to include as part of that. It's just really just showing the well-rounded picture of who we are. And it doesn't mean that we change any aspect of how we express ourselves through dance in a way that might be viewed as too sexy. But I think it's just, we're entitled to that. I don't think we should hide that at all. And it should be part of us deciding how we feel about the way that we're represented and, and adding to that picture as well, not necessarily taken away from it. Yes, so it's the addition. So you're that plus a professional, plus you work hard and train in all of those things. So you don't have to pick and choose and one shouldn't detract from the other necessarily. Mm -hmm. Amanda, you wanna give us one last point to wrap us up? I do, yeah, just that, you know, sometimes in the cheerleading space, there there is also this thought process that NFL cheerleaders, while yes, it's the highest level of cheerleading that you can get, that they're not as athletic as other cheerleaders or they're not as athletic as, um, college cheerleaders or all-star cheerleaders. And if we are really gonna come together and have this trickle down, we also have to throw away that thinking because just because the style looks different doesn't mean that they're any less athletic. And you have cheerleading teams like the Baltimore Ravens, for example, who do tumble, who do stunt, who do you know amazing things that are just as athletic as any other cheerleading program. So I think you're right, the rebranding, the mind shift um, and the mental shift of everybody in the cheerleading space. Great. Well, thank you all. I want to give one big round of applause for the panelists because this was really great. I learned a lot. This was just so insightful um, and a fun, fun time to engage. I want to turn it back over to Professor Pierce to wrap us up or give any final comments in this last minute as we end. Well, I just think that this was an um, amazing opportunity to get some insight into the cheerleading world and to, to hear um, straight from the horse's mouth what you go through and the kind of courageous legal fights that have been going on in, in defense of, of worker rights for cheerleaders, cheerleaders as low wage, low wage workers, and not just workers, but athletes that deserve to be treated as athletes, just like the other athletes in the NFL have been treated who uh, are less conscious about good behavior, but make a whole lot more money in doing whatever they want. And it certainly is a time for wage equity and for this nation to come around and, and respect it. And I hope, hope that um, your, your struggle will bear some good fruit, Sean. And Amanda and, and Makiba, I hope you organize every single one of those cheerleaders in the NFL. Great job, everyone. And thank you, everyone in the audience for coming and joining us today. <laughs>